Acts 18, and this is what I want to do just for a few minutes. Uh, I I really want to to camp on a few questions that the text is going to answer, but specifically just a few questions of why does this program exist? Why do we do Lead Well? What are we aiming to produce, and why should you really care? Acts chapter 18, verse 24 And I'm reading in the message. Oh, man, first time I've done this ever. This is going to be fun. A man named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was a Jew born in Alexandria, Egypt, and a terrific speaker, eloquent, powerful in his preaching of the scriptures. He was well-educated in the way of the master and fiery in his enthusiasm. Apollos was accurate in everything he taught about Jesus up to a point. But he only went as far as the baptism of John. He preached with power in the meeting place. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and told him the rest of the story. I'd like to title this message, The Rest of the Story. The Rest of the Story. Jonathan Gottschall insightfully commented that we are storytelling animals. I love that comment, storytelling animals. We have an insatiable appetite for stories. They are our fuel, they drive us and they're focused what we pay attention to. Stories, they saturate our culture, they're everywhere that you turn. 12 seasons on Netflix, stories on Instagram, stories on your phone when it comes to news. Everywhere you turn, we, are, we, we have an insatiable appetite for stories. They matter. They invite participation. They move us to action. Babette Babette Buster, she takes it to a whole new level when she says this, narrative is our culture's currency. He who has the best story wins. We're living in this day and age of story wars. People, organizations, companies, everywhere you turn, they're competing for mind space and brand allegiance, and their primary tool is stories. In the midst of the story wars that we find ourselves in, there is a human longing, though, to gather the scattered stories of meaning together in some sort of whole. Enter the gospel. The Christian story is, is the story that weaves all of human longings and desires. It weaves it together in a unified whole. Love what N.T. Wright says about the power of stories and our responsibility to it. He says this, an essential part of our theological and missional task is to tell this story as clearly as possible and to allow it to subvert other ways of telling the story of the world. The rest of the story matters. And yet we live in a day and age where the Christian story is literally leaking in the hearts of its followers. So many Christians are missing the rest of the story. I'll give you a few examples. 40% believe, and I'm, talk, I'm talking about those who believe in Jesus, who, are, who follow Jesus. 40% believe that Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of, of just evil in the world. believe that the Holy Spirit is a symbol of God's power or presence, but is not a living entity. 60% of people don't believe in the Trinity. 78% said God is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe who rules the world today. What happened to the other 22%? 55% believe that the Bible is accurate in all of the principles it teaches. 40% of millennial believers think that it is morally wrong to share their faith. 22% believe that Jesus Christ sinned when he lived on the earth. There's never been a more vital point in our current historical moment where careful attention needs to be put to the rest of the story. And in Acts chapter 18... Uh, what happens in this moment is that we are given an inside look of one man's discovery of the rest of the story and the implications of that 
personally and for the church that he's connected to. His name is Apollos. He's from Alexandria. It's a capital of the Roman province of Egypt. It's founded by Alexander the Great, and it was a hub for Jews in Egypt. There was a million in, in that region. 600,000 lived in Alexandria. Uh, there's, it was an intellectual haven. Uh, Josephus actually said that there was over a half a million scrolls that existed in one of the libraries. And they had a, they had a handful. And what we find is that his name is is, is Apollos, but he's named after the Greek god Apollo, the god of archery and music and dance and truth and prophecy and healing and diseases and truth and a lot of uh, additional things. He's eloquent, which I love this because it's the best of Greek culture. That's who he was. He spoke beautifully, but he's also fervent in the scriptures, the best of the Jewish culture. He's this mashup. He loved the scriptures. He, he loved what he knew about Jesus. He, he was passionate. And just a side note, aren't you and I, I'm, I know I am, aren't you glad that God uses us even when we don't necessarily know the rest of the story? Like it's really good news that this is, we're on a life journey of discovering the rest of the story. And you have in this man, Apollos, he seemed like he had it. Except we find that he had a biblical gap. It was a pretty substantial gap, but it was a gap nonetheless. He, he only knew the baptism of John. It was a baptism of repentance. And that's what he preached. What we can c- conclude or deduce is that Apollos didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah yet. But he loved who he knew in Jesus, and he preached him with all that he had. And what you have under, underneath the overarching story of the book of Acts is this, is this beautiful principle of God's sovereignty. That, that it's, it's moving and God is at work and he is, he is now maneuvering and adjusting and bringing people together all for a purpose. That God was the purpose in the book of Acts. In fact, it says this, and Mr. Tom, Alan Tom, Thompson, he writes this, Luke is drawing attention to the continued outworking of God's saving purposes, specifically in the inaugurated kingdom, the kingdom of God, through the reign of the Lord Jesus. The focus of the book of Acts is actually on God. So you have this God, and he's constantly working things together. And in this moment in Acts 18, you have this, the beginning of the third missionary journey of Paul. And Luke just happens to kick it off with Apollos. What we find is that he, he's in this defining moment and he doesn't even realize it. And he, he, he meets Priscilla and, and Aquila. And what the text says is they pulled him aside. Now, I, I love this because what, what the, the original kind of language in Greek, what this word actually means is to take to oneself. A lot of people, at least the, the the commentators that I read, they, they thought this was a moment of correction, somewhat punitive. But the heart of the word is that Priscilla and Aquila, their heart is open to a man who is somewhat alone. And they, 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 they now create this, this safe space for Apollos to come aside. And, and what, what, I mean, this moment of sacrifice for Apollos, I'm not sure if he knew this, these, these, this amazing couple. But the way that they approached him was one of of such grace and compassion and commitment to him and and an invitation to have a conversation. And that's what happens. He comes side. And you have the sacrifice of Apollos to acknowledge he doesn't know it all. And you have the vision of Priscilla and Aquila who sees someone that nobody else sees, but sees that person for what God wants to make them. Pull him aside. And then it says they told him the rest of the story. My mom, growing up, had a very unique relationship with honey. She loved it, and it was like Windex for the man in my big fat Greek wedding. Like, he put Windex on everything. You got a third degree burn? Here's some honey. 
You've got something going on with your throat. Honey, you want stir fry? <laughs> honey, you want a concoction to marinate a steak? We got honey. I, I, th- this, this was, growing up, this was a staple in the home. But, but when it comes to honey, it was way more than that. It brought vibrancy. It extenuated the flavors. It added joy. It brought healing where needed. I can only imagine Priscilla and Aquila taking this beauty, this honey of the cross and, re- and, and the resurrection of Jesus. These, these, these two defining moments, a, a, a two-sided coin of God's mercy and grace to humanity, and they take the honey of the resurrection, the honey of the cross, and they begin to just add it to Jesus, he's Lord. Hey, Apollos, Jesus, you know what? He's the Messiah with grace and with the spirit of God. Something begins to get unlocked in Apollos. He begins, they begin to unlock the, the doctrine of the resurrection, the power of the Holy Spirit, who he was, the fact that he now wants to fill us with himself and now send us and go with us in the process. You got to, you got to, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they're, they're just slowly, they're creating a story way more than just an intellectual moment or a transfer of doctrines or, or this young man becoming a parrot. There was something being formed in his heart as a result of the story. That, the, that, that not only does, that is there a Holy Spirit, but there's also that this Jesus, he's going to return. You have this moment of, of dialogue where Priscilla and Aquila, they tell him the story, and it was way more than just this one man getting the story. The story begins to get him. It begins to get Apollos. He begins to to now transfer from from just uh, information to the story becomes the source for Apollos from that point forward. Uh, my, my, My kids, when they were in Florida... Um, when it would get 130 degrees and, and they would still want to go outside, but they would want to go outside for the purpose of a, of a water gun fight. And like all water guns, the water guns would go out real quick. And so they would get buckets and they would throw buckets of water. The buckets of water would go out real quick. And then one of my kids, what he did is he went to the spigot with the hose with the gun, they can take the skin off, right? That gun. And, and all of a sudden, I heard screaming outside. I went, I went out, and, and Zach has got the hose. And he looks at me, and he goes, Dad, I've got the source. <laughs> and he who has the source wins. That what Apollos had is that Apollos had the source. Amen. That you had the resurrected king. This, this combination of Jesus is at the cross, Jesus at the resurrection, and now you've got a man who has been captivated by the story. And so now the question is, what does the story do in Apollos? Thank you for asking. Look at the next verse in verse 27. This is, now, at, before, before you like dive into this, there's this key word in verse 27, and when, and when. See, that word when is a cause and effect word. You see that word in verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila are talking to Apollos. It might be in your Bible. It says, but, it said, but when Priscilla, that's the cause. So what happens as a result of the cause is the effect that we are about to read. Check this out. And when he wished to cross to Achaia. As a result of having the rest of the story, Apollos is moved into mission. And when he wished to cross to a cave, that's, that's Corinth. He, that as a result of hearing the story, there was a motivation. There was something that now quickened him. He's got to do something with what he has. It's not just he had the story, the story had him. The brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. Do you realize that because he had the rest of the story, he got moved into spiritual family? That's what the the text says. That that, that as a result of him receiving this, it it captures him. 
And now there's something that happens in Apollos' life that now the brothers write a recommendation letter, give it to Apollos. He goes to Corinth, gives it to the brothers at Corinth that there was now an insertion of this man into spiritual family because he had the rest of the, of, of the story. For he powerful, I'm sorry, uh, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. His spiritual gifts are working now. That there's grace on this man to teach. Why? Because he had the rest of the story. That he was moving into his giftings. He was now, he had, he had given himself to this, to this reality of a new kingdom told by Priscilla and Aquila and it wasn't just that he got it, it got him. Created now a desire to, to enter into spiritual family, enter into mission, and ultimately enter into his gifts. And then finally this. He sh- um, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. He had a passion for Jesus. For Jesus. No, notice the difference between how he talks about Jesus in verse 28 and how he talked about him in verse 26. It is drastically different. One is acknowledging and observing that Jesus was who he said that he was or that he, he, he was Lord. In this, he's now refuting and proving Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. I, I love what C.S. Lewis, he says this. Um, at the end of mere... Christianity he says this, look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. This is what happens with Apollos. He found the story and the story just began to birth new passions new desires, new momentum, new connections. Love how Martin Luther, before he passed away, he, w- he just, he knew that he knew that he knew that the writer of Hebrews was Apollos. This is, this is what this man has now, now again, that's, that's just, just sanctified imagination because we don't know who wrote the book Hebrews But just imagine if that's who wrote it. The impact of the rest of the story impacts us. So what does that have to do with lead well? I think it has everything to do with it. What we want to do here is we want to create a space for you to come aside. For you to come aside and just taste the rest of the story. No matter where you are in your spiritual development, no matter where you are in your theology, the beauty about... The rest of the story, I, a few years back, went back and got my master's because I felt a lot like Apollos. I just, I knew there was something that God wanted to do to form his scriptures, to form the person of Jesus, to awaken something new in me. I, I just sensed God needs to, to, to go to work on the inside of me, and he wanted to do it through a program, through a two-year program. That this is... This is an opportunity for you to consider, God, what might you want to do in me and through me in forming the rest of the story in my life? That what we want to do when it comes to lead well as we move forward is that this is a, this is a space, a safe space for you to interact with theology, with life, and with mission, all intersecting, all working together, all being formed freshly, to, to, to ultimately help you treasure Jesus, consider how that word and the person of Jesus intersects with, with life on Monday, and then what he might be wanting to do in you and through you in regards to mission. Like, this is what Lead Well is about. This is not a, a Bible study program. This is not even a seminary. It's way more than that. This is about theology, life, mission, working together. What if you were to come, to come aside for two years? What if you were to, to, to really consider, God, what might I need to do to sacrifice some things so that you can form yourself in me? 
And here's just a couple of goals. Just a few things that we want to accomplish in the years to come. This upcoming year, we want to have 90% of the people that start this program graduate. 90% graduation rate for year one into year two and year two into graduation. And the way that we're going to accomplish that is really simple. We want, we really believe that this is such an important program that our administration, uh, the, just the focus of schedule, just we, we really want to ratchet this up as, as it pertains to making this an encounter and experience that you just enjoy. And then ultimately, this is going to allow for you to get to know brand new people, begin to do life with them. Is that when you enter in, what's, what's going to happen? We're going to, we're going to have a year one dean and a year two dean. We're going to have a coach of coaches. We're going to have a, an, an experience for you to be in a cohort where there's going to be a coach that values you, that is going to be walking with you, that is going to help you be formed by the rest of the story. So what we want to do is, is we want to send five people next year to our D.C. church plants. That's one of the reasons that Lead Well exists, is to empower and then to send you into all of the things that we're doing to win the city. And then, and then our, our goal is as the years go on, the number goes on, right? Like it's going to increase. So five is our goal. I, I'm hoping that as people walk across the stage for next year, we'll be able to announce their name and which ward they're going to. This is what we want to accomplish. This is not just about learning information. It's not just about getting a, 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 an increase or a download of knowledge. This is about your heart coming alive as a result of the rest of the story, impacting you, connecting you with spiritual family, and sending you on mission. One of the things that we're, we're going to do at the end of next year, we're going to have two mission trips, specifically for those who have gone through year one and year two that we're going to have a local missions trip and a global one, that we actually believe that everything that you've learned, everything that has been forming you, that we want to partner with you in actually going to places where you have to actually put it into practice. Like this is what we want to create here, is a space where you are coming face to face with your own depravity and your own gaps and going, God, form me. Shape me, allow for the rest of the story to bring me to life. Philip Hughes um, was a part of John Calvin's academy. It was, a, it was an academy created in 1559 in Geneva. And he, he saw it, he experienced it. And this is what he said. The reason I read this is because this is my dream for Leadwell. Calvin's Geneva was something very much more than a haven and a school. It was not a, theo the a theological ivory tower that lived to itself and for itself, ob ob oblivious to its responsibility in the gospel to the needs of others. Human vessels were equipped and refitted in this haven and that they might launch out into the surrounding ocean of the world's need. Bravely facing every storm and peril that await them in order to bring the light of Christ's gospel to those who were in the ignorance and darkness from which they themselves had originally come. They were taught in this school in order that they in turn might teach others the truth that had set them free. This is our goal. This is what we're creating. This is a place where you are going to be formed in Christ. That the rest of the story is going to come alive. That it's going to be like honey that just begins to seal some things and quicken you. And, and, and it's going to be sticky in your own soul. And you're going to be able to now look at the world around you through a new perspective. And with new partnerships and new mission and new opportunities and new sending. What I love about the way that Apollos, the way that he, 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 gets, he gets picked up again in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. This is a story that God promises to get behind. God promises to get behind the story. 
question is, will we? Will we? And I know for, for, for some of us, we can't do a two-year a two program. We just, don't, we just don't have the capacity right now. And I understand. I, I, I really do. But can, can you do one thing for me? Can you find someone else who's a little bit farther down the road in their relationship with Jesus? Sit down and open up the book of 1 Peter and start reading the Bible with them. There's something that this story teaches me. The power of relationship and how God's grace gushes to bind us to his word and to one another. And this, this is what Lead Well is about. And I want to invite you to prayerfully just really begin to consider, God, what might you want to do in this program to form your word in me? Now, here's, here's a, a list of all of the, the experience or the uh, informational sessions that we're going to have. We've got a lot, we've got a lot of them. We've got four of them. The first is going to begin May 15th. It's going to be a Sunday after church. We, we believe this is going to fill out pretty fast. And so I want you to pray. I want you to keep your ears tuned on when this, again, just as a reminder when it comes to these, these sessions. But um, for those of you who graduated, congratulations. For those of you who will, I cannot wait to see you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in this church to bring the word to life. God, we want to be a people of the book. We want to be a people that your word forms us and shapes us. It awakens us. It strengthens us. It binds us together with one another. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the resurrected Jesus that now is, is inviting us to be those who are shaped by the rest of the story. And God, I thank you for, for the years to come where Lead Well will, will be the foundational point of sending missionaries, sending those who are going to lead and equip and support just our church plant in, 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 in D.C. I'm just so excited about what you're going to do in this program. Lord, we love you. Thank you for it. We thank you for your word. Amen.